so recording has started. Okay. So everybody, please go to, once again, the OSC Machine Design Guide wiki page if you'd like to follow. William's going to post this on the over up on top on the screen behind me. I'm going to go through the document so people can follow the document. There's links in the document that are useful so we can view those as well. Uh, can we maybe shut down the right. shut it up? Go to the bathroom. There's a plug. Oh, you can plug it. Yeah, you can plug it. There's uh, three plugs. It's the one with the heaviest outlet. It's the one with the heaviest plug. Yep, that one. I'm wow. shining light at you, right? <laughs> you look so glowing. Yeah. I'm glowing, yay! <laughs> you want some sunglasses? No, I, it's kind of, I can't see it. Well, but, okay. <laughs> you know what else have a hard time connecting here? Yeah, we're working on it. We oh. just rebooted the router. We just rebooted. Oh, never mind. <laughs> He was mighty popular, man. <laughs> <laughs> He's the king of the house. <laughs> I love that. Good morning. That's how we got it. That's my. That's my bag. Yeah, I don't even have my bag. Yeah, we'll start. I got it. Yeah, we'll start. Yeah, we'll start. Yeah, and then we'll get into the. Okay, let's do. Michael. And I want to I want to talk about just like what what's this like the scope of what what, what we want to achieve? You know, uh, do we want everybody to have you know the experience of building one, or do we want to get seven of them built, or use some way exactly? On that spectrum or yep, that's that's good to cover. And then how to um, accomplish that? You know, if whatever direction we're going to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that red light supposed to be red? Uh, is that so? So you've got you've got connectivity but no uh, internet connection. It may still be yes. Oh, yes. Mark, March was yes. on your house this morning. Yeah. Uh, Is Katrina still up there? It was it was odd down here this morning for a while. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. right. It was just on like two minutes so before we started. Check it out there. Micro house four. Right here. See. Oh, yes. <laughs> wow. Yeah, old school wiki. Yeah. It's open. Anyone who wants to come see it? It is. We, Our process is already open. Just come to Kansas. Yeah, right? <laughs> oh, did you write on it? We actually um, wrote a so, whole bunch of processes to Yeah, some ideas. Of, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. In no, 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 you're fine. You're fine. Go ahead. No. Basically, are you going to present us? it? Or? Yeah, we oh, are. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about it then. Yeah. Okay. Later. It's like how we're going to yeah. build the 3D printers to get it done. So we're reorganizing how we do the 3D printers so that we can have an efficient process and everyone will learn how to work like fingers of one hand. And at the end of our four days, we should have them very close to being done. With input from the group about what you know, like the experience experiences and like yeah. what everybody wants out of it. So, yeah, if you go down to the workshop now, you notice. Did you notice? 
Uh-huh. Yeah, we, is this the thing that you were mentioning yesterday? I don't know who was mentioning what. I, uh-huh. Last night we were just reflecting yeah. after the session, and the, one of the feedbacks was that it became rather chaotic with so many printers. And oh, where's the two eyes of mine? Well, no, I'm hiding this part under my printer. No one's going to see it. Like, where was the green box? It just happened to be behind your printer, but you couldn't see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe not necessarily. Yeah. It's fine. I'm not going to give it to anybody, but it's no, fine. But yeah, if it feels like that. About it, and you have to wander exactly. around. Yeah. 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 Very yeah. figurative. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
disorganized chaos or whatever it was. So we got some progress and a lot of people kind of went through the uh, very challenging sort of experience of putting something together and realizing, oh, that's not exactly the right length of the bolt we took apart. Put it back together, oh, we forgot the nut catch here. So I did that yesterday, so I took it apart, put it back. And then you put it back together and, oh, the motor is in the wrong orientation. For now it's okay, but later you'll find it makes it a lot messier if you don't have the motors in the right orientation. So um, we've gone through that, and so now let's reflect. What made the American economy just zip along uh, in like 100 years ago? It was the invention of the assembly line. And then what is making companies really uh, successful these days? The ability to distribute decision-making power right down to the front lines. So that distinguishes an excellent company from one that's just going to just struggle along. Toyota is a good example. If you're in Toyota, you are making decisions that are key to the company if you are any level of worker, from the CEO right down to the very basic someone who's putting in a nut and bolt somewhere. So you are encouraged to go through a process where you do something, you reflect on it and say, oh, if only we could have this kind of tool, it would make it a little faster. And so that's what they do at Toyota. They reflect, they go through a cycle of learning and then they reflect on it and individuals are empowered to work. And it becomes like the fingers of one hand. That's what I like to use in my classroom. We are one hand, but each finger has a different role. So, but the thing with your hand, you can't switch your thumb to your index and so on. But in a team, you can do that. You can be the thumb one day and then you can be the <coughs> pinky the next day. And there's no glory in being the thumb or the pinky. The glory is that the hand works in a coordinated fashion. And so if you organize your company like that, even being a CEO is not a special thing, it's just a certain role. The CEO has decision-making power about how we interact with other companies and how we make the biggest financial decisions. That's it. But the CEO in an advanced company cannot tell the frontline worker to use the green screwdriver instead of the red one, because they know the green one is slightly more efficient for some reason. And so, but in a lot of companies, I like red, use the red one. <laughs> you get kind of stuff like that coming down. So if we think of the process that we're doing like that, and think of how we can organize ourselves today, um, maybe we can make a little bit more efficient uh, process to finish the printers. Hi, John. Are you suggesting we create an assembly line? Yeah, we actually partially uh, did that last night just by cleaning up. We haven't created it yet, but we've created the suggestion. And we wanted to involve the group's feedback. Like, we could very much today just go down and do the same thing, except you're going to find where the screwdrivers are because they're all in one pile. So, yeah. Yeah. What, what, what comes to my mind when we start going down that route, like, it makes a whole lot of sense if we're just trying to get these done as fast as possible. Yeah. But I think from, like, the learning aspect, mm -hmm. like, if I'm just focused on one part of the machine, then I don't really know how the other parts function and how they go together. Yeah. So that kind of feels like it, it's a trade-off. Like, it is. I mean, it that's is. why we want to have this conversation and get everyone's feet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Is there a way to still have the assembly line with the parts in each station, but move your printer to that station? I think Ooh. there are ways. You could to do, do that. that. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, there are. See, we've got the yin and the yang of it. So one pathway could that be each pair struggle through all the seven or eight stages of whatever it is. <laughs> and the thing is, like, if we. <coughs> If we look at the big picture, then we're going through a difficult learning process for the frame, X, Y, Z, and electronics and control board aspects of the printer. And the extruder, if that's going to be a good one. So that's one way to look William, at it. William, would you mind coming here? Because so, we're oh, recording yeah, this as well. Oh. And I don't know how I got there, but. <laughs> 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 it's just suddenly I was just standing there. <laughs> Being a good presenter, that's how. <laughs> That's what I, yeah, I like to have eye contact with everyone, and uh, I just couldn't quite see some of them way back there, like Scott, he's kind of hiding behind Devin, yeah. <laughs> so, um, the, what we did last night is essentially we just cleaned up and organized. So there are two pathways we could take. We could take the same pathway as yesterday, or we could try the assembly line approach. And uh, I don't know, maybe Michael oh, might want to present a few it's ideas not, it's about not just It's not just two pathways, and I think... Um, what, what I identified last night on my cardboard wiki here, <laughs> yeah. I didn't have a wiki, and you guys are welcome to look this over, I don't know if it'll make a lot of sense, I'm, I can explain it if you want me to, 
Um, but what I think I identified uh, that we need to decide on as a group is exactly what John brought up, which is what is the scope that we're trying to achieve here? Are we looking for an experience of a two-team member per uh, two-team member group uh, walking through an entire build, um, and we're less concerned about you know being done in four days with seven printers? You know, that's what we're. I think that's kind of what we're trying to balance. Is that is that you know effectively it? we're trying to balance you know that learning experience with accomplishing a, a tangible uh, a material goal. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of ways to approach that. It's not just we can go back down and have chaos, or we have to have an assembly line. I think because there's you know there's a lot of different ways to do an assembly line, uh, <coughs> like uh, Rihanna, Rihanna, Raya, Raya, Raya. Um, I'll answer to all of them. Okay. Uh, uh, pointed out um, that the and I hadn't even thought of that. You know, I was thinking more like um, you have a station for yeah, each yeah. assembly part. So you have a, a station for Axis One, and the the group at that station learns how to assemble that part. And I think this was kind of some of John's thing that you only learn how to assemble that one piece, and then the printer moves along, and you stay at that station, and you develop an expertise, which which creates an efficiency. Um, uh, for assembling that part, and what uh, William brought up last night is that you, we can we can develop documentation, um, and so you become an expert in that one assembly uh, technique, and you can develop the documentation for that, and then make that um, available to everyone else. So you take notes and uh, and then disseminate that knowledge. Um, you don't have the hands-on, tangible experience, but you do learn from everybody else's experience. <laughs> and and I'm not saying that's the right way to go. I'm just I'm, I'm um, elaborating on uh, the, the trade-offs that can be made. Um, go ahead. The only concern I have there, one, from my perspective, I would want to go through the whole process. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also cool to be able to have I thought about it, taking the machine from the station to the only because when he and I were working effectively and focused, everything was going good, but then when the outside department came in to help, it kind of rewrenches in there. Like even when um, a specialist or something that we well knowledge like knowledge mm -hmm. what we were doing, they're still errors that remaining. Mm -hmm. Because they yeah. weren't there from the beginning. Yeah. Some of the factors of what we had already established because our machine is not like the original. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Eamon and I have two spacers on one side of ours. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the machine that we're working on, not necessarily our printer. Yeah. Oh, um, I, don't know. I, I think if we were doing assembly line from the very beginning, it would be nice, it would be cool to yeah. continue it, but we were already like <clears throat> pretty into it. Mm -hmm. We have almost our axes built, we got to build some more. I mean, we're, we're, we're getting, we're almost, I don't want to say we're almost finished, I don't know exactly where we are, <laughs> but we're pretty far. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, well, uh, so, to, to, to address that, Justin and William had really good points last night, um, and I think William brought up that we can set up, so we have uh, an array of different um, levels of completion right now, and we could just start the assembly line there, and then I think Justin's idea was that um, group right now, each team right now, um, can share where they're at and maybe any, any differences they have from what they've done right now. And so it's not, we're not starting like we would with a normal assembly line, but it sounds like with, with the ideas from Justin and William that we could kick that off and get into an assembly line. Um, I think okay. had, well, you kind of addressed one of them with the first bit, and the assembly line has a range of vendors from zero to hundred percent and they just gradually move through the process and so it's difficult to get that going to start off with. But if the I guess we do have a range already. Uh, but as you kept talking it, it it sounded complicated. Like it'd be really hard to, to manage and I would probably be continually losing track of where I was in the process and what's up with this printer and mm -hmm. etc. There um Based on the ideas presented so far, because some people would like to have the experience of building a whole printer, and some people would like to see the organization, the instruction sets, 
and just the overall picture being completed. So one thing that comes to mind to satisfy both of those perspectives, imagine we were to take seven printers and assign each one to an individual. So uh, there's one individual for each printer and they start at the start of the assembly line. So then those who really want to get the whole process are going to see their printer through the whole process. Then we have seven other people at say seven stages. One is on the frame, then the X, the Y, Z, and then the electronics board and the extruder. So that's something like six or seven. And maybe the seventh is let's test it or something. Yeah. So, yeah. Here's another, uh, see, our purpose is here to learn how to build the printer. Yes. I want to know all of it. Yes. So what I expect from you individually, yeah. I'm, I'm just monitoring you. You give me a box with my parts yeah. and tools mm -hmm. in front of me. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, what I do, I have everything there on my table. You just give me the information. Remember the 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 center axis, what do you call it? Z axis yeah. holes are already there. Be careful. Yeah. So this information you need to give me. And you yes. didn't give me that. So okay. this is the, this the is like thing, Yeah. The other thing is when we before we install the motor, we have to adjust that pole. Mm -hmm. We did not do that. Nobody told us. Now it may we may have problem. So those little things, if, if you guys tell us, write it on a piece of paper. I think we can and do put that. put it on my basket, yeah. I will do the job. I don't need anything else. So this is where so I was I'm thinking. I'm assembly by myself. I think we can achieve that. The way that we can do that, like if you just allow every, there are seven individuals who have one printer, and there are seven individuals at one station. So each member of the station becomes an expert in that process and provides the directions, the tricks, the instructions to those seven people who proceed in order through the stations. So maybe you will take your printer and go through. And as you go to each station, you're going to build it with the help and instruction of the station master. So when you come through, you've done the whole printer. Beautiful. And then you get the instructions and the person at the station, the station masters will generate the wiki instructions and it goes up online. So that's a hybrid proposal to satisfy both perspectives and Reina has it. And then also Is there enough time that, is going to, that we can have a station master that can be affected? On well, the, process? the station master is not going to be effective on the first printer and a little better on the second. But by the seventh, yeah. we'll have a detailed... <laughs> yeah, or even if you're the third or fourth, it's a better. So, it's so maybe be some more intrepid station. members can be the, the point of the arrow. So if there's, there's error, it's only on one printer. Yeah, the first printer going through is going to slow down a little. Uh -huh. yeah. But by the time we go through the seventh, it's going to sweep through quickly. Yeah. So <laughs> that's the proposal. And then each station master, to speed it up though, we spend some time carefully planning and have each station master have a discussion with Marchin about what is going on with this, what do we need to remember, and we generate a basic plan to begin with. So I, if we do it carefully and we don't try to hurry, I think we can make it more efficient, and at the end we come up with a set of instructions for everyone. I yes. think. Okay, I think have we built a torch table at a workshop before? Uh, that's... Or the, the, the big one that we I don't know if we've done that. The before. torch table, we've done a big prototype in a workshop. The days other days one, days? that was three day. Three day, Scott? Like five or with four five or people. Five. It was a yeah. small workshop. Okay. Because I was just wondering, like, is it even effective for us to even try time management or time manage that in order to include that, or should we just make it about building the printer? Let's just try to see. We can maybe reflect in the next two days and see if people's yeah. sentiments change based on our experience. Yeah. We're at day, day three, so basically we passed halfway point on a 3D printer. So we, we're allotting the four days, first four days, once again with the idea that pending those printers working, when we need them, we can build parts for the large machine. Otherwise, we, we would be reduced only to the one-inch universal axis for which we already have parts by, for example, stripping that torch table that we already have with the one-inch universal axis. Yeah. Well, I think Eamon wanted to get in here to stand up. I mean, I was going to say, uh, like, I don't, I'm not positive about the, like, the different stations. I feel like that would be a really good thing if we had, like, a continual flow of learning. But, like, yeah. what, this oh, one that, that, that doesn't have the two X's on already, so then we're, we're down one. Yeah. And then, <coughs> no one is yeah. dead at the, like, the 
the end points and by the time we get to the end points the first few are probably done. Mm. Like the, the first few steps are going to be done. Yeah. So I don't think that like that the seven seven for example is going to to work that way. Yeah. yeah. It, it seems like we, we um, it seems like we, we want to focus on getting everything to the same stage and yeah. accurate uh, first. And then, then, then once all, all of them are the same, then we move on to doing the uh, hybrid assembly line. So, go ahead. Yep. Well, yeah, I, I, I was going to speak to that. I wanted to know how long we thought it would take for us to figure out where we're at yeah. in the different stages and then how long it would take for right. all of them to level up to kind of the same stage. As I've said, another way to do it is William or March or someone is just standing up in front of their box for all the same stage and just be like, all right, everyone pick up widget A and, and nut B and then do it, you know, and then just kind of verbally and physically show order of operations and we're kind of just following one person at the right part of where building the box and then we're just kind of in real time, we're all picking up the same pieces and, and assembling it together, but again, we kind of have to start at the, at the same time. That could work, actually. Yeah, I, I do like, like that. Like instruction. I do like that. Like, one, it, it seems like the most feasible so far. Yeah, that is. Yeah. I, mean, I, I still feel like there could be, like, oh, where's this piece? Oh, I don't know, did you have this piece? You know, I mean, it might take a little bit, but yeah, we just should in theory yeah. still well, work. So, <laughs> so, we can get away from, sorry, I, go ahead. Okay, I didn't want to talk over you. Um, so we don't necessarily have to do the stations. I think maybe just the location of where tools are at, or each team has this set of tools. So you're not wandering around looking for an Allen wrench, or the like one or two wrenches that you have that will actually fit the nut. Um, you know, find some more tools that I assume are laying around here. I mean, there's a whole workshop, a couple of workshops, I think, um, and you know, find the right amount of tools so that we're not um, spending a lot of time wandering around looking for stuff and have, okay, these parts are located here. And we kind of um, uh, uh, took that initiative last night um, to go ahead and organize everything, but but to extend that organization. So we can still, we don't necessarily have to have stations. I think just a little bit better organization of where parts are at, where tools are at, would make yeah. things go more smoothly. That's right. Like that, I agree with that. That didn't frustrate me. Like, it didn't bother me looking for the stuff as much as the lack of information, like me trying to figure it out just looking at a machine mm -hmm. and then putting it together based on my visual than actual having the information. Mm -hmm. you know, so I could find the stuff within a few minutes, but then looking, discerning on my, by myself, but really not even understanding the machine yeah. or what is, what is behind this or in that, and then having to redo it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But going through that process, Going through each stage, so with the different stations, mm -hmm. I really agree with that part. Okay. Um, so, so I think most of our time was based on finding tools, finding parts, mm -hmm. and then mistakes. Mm -hmm. So mistakes, if you show us at the beginning as you suggested, it can go away. Mm -hmm. yeah. Z axis is there. The holes are already there. Have to adjust the motor, make sure mm -hmm. the motor direction is right. So this this little thing. Then the tools. <coughs> Give everybody to his own tools, maybe. So I don't go and look for the tools. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to rent including the last fifteen minutes. Mm -hmm. I wanted the parts. The city don't have it. Uh, March Marsha was supposed to print it. I don't know if it's that. Yeah. We most of our time was basically this. Yeah. Well, well and you really you know, you're on the class, right? So when you when you're walking around looking at your lab stations as a kid working, yeah. when you see something, oh my god, they're taking apart the motor, they need to make sure that the motor the pulley is uh, you know, a millimeter above the top of the motor or whatever it is. You make an out to the device. Mm -hmm. So hey guys, if you're taking apart a motor, please make sure. Right? So yeah. that the same mistake doesn't propagate to many of the people in the group. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or a second or third or fourth mistake, you're keeping an eye on the whole group making sure that these things are out. Thank you. 
intention is to have a box and have some of this organization yes. it didn't happen and so now we're trying to get to that point with the group I think you know um, yeah we could I mean that's what we tried I said hey people pick out all the parts get all they're in a the stack get your box uh, start working yeah and and it's just for the access parts but I don't think anybody but myself kinda, included knew what parts we needed or how it went together or right. the differences between the parts and everything it yeah. took me a day or two to figure out like <laughs> To be able to distinguish them. Mm -hmm. We had a parts list, and then we could you know, check it off as we went through and found it. And yeah. I didn't know what we did. Yeah, and a, and a picture representation of what that thing looks like, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Still, it's, 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 yeah, we gotta get all those. Mark, 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 uh, Martian can show us. This uh, goes here, this goes here. Yeah, yeah it would still be good to have some kind of a written thing because otherwise I'll see that and forget it anyway. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Well, the screws were black on the model, and then you could find the black screws for your, for your own model. You know, but they're not. They're all so Yeah. Well, and I think, I mean, I think there's some amount of problem solving that's going to go into that. that you know, you've got a one inch screw, okay, that's a one inch screw, and that's a half inch screw, and you don't have that label. Um, and I think, uh, Scott, right? Not even close. <laughs> Not even close. Had a really good I'm idea. I'm flattered. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, let's got it here. Okay, I, there's the name here. Okay, got it. Um, had a really good idea about printing um, a, a letter or a number label into the part itself. Right. And I think that would be a, a, a huge advantage. Right. Just kind of, like, just kind of as an iteration. Putting, putting a uh, letter, some kind of uh, you know, identifier on the part, just like in Ikea, right? Yeah. Putting a bookshelf or something like that, it's like A, B, C, D, right? It's like, Use all right, a that's it. And yeah. that, way, that way, even if you have uh, reference material like a, uh, a 3D, you know, isometric uh, you know, view of, of how it's supposed to be assembled, you know which part goes where because they're identified. I think we we all been through it yesterday when we, we picked a uh, piece and we were like super happy that we found it and then we're putting it in and then like oh man it's like two holes I need three and then yeah. you're just taking it all apart so yeah for me for me I was just a part of a uh, learning process but it would have been so much easier like oh it's the same it's in the other right. I have yeah, a thing occurs yeah. to me that a number of these pieces that we're using were designed for prototyping they have a bunch of interchangeable holes that can be configured in a variety of different ways. And which doesn't necessarily match up with the idea of having a pre uh, prefix blueprint that is only designed to go together one way, uh, like like an IKEA thing. Or, or you can still screw up IKEA. I did. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, who has it? <laughs> you know, it's an, an, uh, of note that um, the, that there may be. Uh, the parts and the blueprint idea may be a little bit at odds. Um, I, don't, I don't know whether, I guess your solution depends on what you're really trying to do. So. Yeah. I think, I mean, some level of instruction, though. I mean, there may be interchangeable right, yeah. parts and, and um, you know, like you, the clamshells are uh, reversible and, you know, they're, they're a mirror image of each other. Um, so things like that. But I think a little bit of, of, of a visual aid would be, would be useful. So, um, yeah. Uh, so I'm so happy you guys have started with this. So you got a problem you got involved. That's cool. um, beautiful. That's very beautiful. So thank you, Alan. I think we do have to decide. Yes, that's that's exactly where I was headed. Thank you. Um, Good discussion. What have, what have we decided? <laughs> yeah, I think we've got a lot out there on the floor. Um, uh, does anybody else have anything to add? So and in in reference um, to kind of what. Uh, uh, Manny was saying, uh, and this came up in, in some conversations that, that, that were had last night about, well, because because I felt like you, I want a plan sheet and I want to put this thing together, let's, you know, but some people are really enjoying just the experience, like they care that there isn't a plan set. 
<laughs> I wasn't going to identify you. I was just going to talk to you. <laughs> because I think it's an, it's, it's, an, it's, it's an interesting perspective, um, you know, to have that, you know, yeah, we don't have a plan set, but he's making the best of what we've got, and he's really excited about it. Um, and it's more about the experience. And, yeah, so what, you have to take it apart five times. What, what, and, that's, and that's what came back to the scope, and that's why I started there, because what are we trying to get out of there? This is the experience of taking it apart, putting it back together five times, and really knowing how that thing works. Because you aren't going to make those mistakes again, ever. Like, when you put it together, you will never make that mistake again. Um, probably. Yeah, pro <laughs> probably. Probably. Oh, wow. Probably. Like, watch you know? Forward, you know? Yeah. You do it wrong, you got to do it. Yeah, so, they, so is, is, it, is it more about the experience? Do we want some kind of hybrid there? you want some instruction so we can still make mistakes? And it also came up... Um, uh, talking about well, what kind of additional modifications can be made. I think, you know, um, uh, uh, printing, uh, uh, you know, some kind of identifier on it, you know, things that you can identify, you know, where are we spending our time? Um, uh. I've got an idea. What if we, like, the one thing I'm thinking is the whole ballast thing between, like, competition and collaboration. So what if we use, like, we kind of use that, you know, and try to find a balance. So what we did is we did two test groups. So we did one side of the 3D printers, you guys try the assembly line thing. The other side, we just work on our machines and we see at the end of it which machines are the most quality. And then we also can take into consideration how fast and how much each person on each team thinks they learn. Um, but I think that, that metric, you're missing the experience metric. You're not measuring that. And I don't know if that's a measurable thing. You, you said, you know, what's the quality? That's a measurable thing. And you said how much time that's a measurable thing, but you're 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 missing the experience element. What ex like do the people that go the whole thing? Is that's that the experience they, they want? Is that is how do you rate that? You know? And how do you rate quality? There are all different qualities right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you're starting at the beginning, that'd be effective. How those things like all measured, like how like evenly it's all put together so it's like no, it's how it works simply. Like, are you getting excellent prints? Yeah. Simple. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, that would be the Because then we go ahead, because the room seems to be split on the simple line and the do-it-yourself. Well, I mean, I don't know if this necessary is, but I'm still on board with the, uh, with the somebody stand up and give one instruction at a time and everybody does the instruction. Exactly, yeah. And they have their own box for it together. Because I, I feel like that's a nice combination of, of everybody to do it, but also there's a clear set of instructions that, that, um, that you can follow. You know, I think from the learning aspect that the whole, like having to take your part is like, it just solidifies how to do it the right way. Like more so than, than just watching and replicating. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like when I'm taking something apart, I learned, oh, I have it be done. Instead, I take it apart and then not having the instructions, then going to put that together, I forget to do something that I had already done. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I have yes. to go back and put in what I have done the first time, but forgot to do it the second time, and it's just like. Yeah, so where do you need to just slow down while we're doing it? <laughs> but, but, uh, that's that's a great point because it's where do you want to spend your time? You know, do you want to spend your time taking this thing apart and putting it back together five times? That's why you and need to go making slower. and making the same mistakes because you're inexperienced taking it apart and putting it back together. You're gaining that experience, but that experience already exists because Martians already put it together. Exactly. Why don't we stand on the shoulders of giants? And then make the improvements that are suggested, instead of making those same mistakes over and over and over again. That's that's the idea of like a like you know instruction or drawing, is that you don't have to say, make those same mistakes that everyone else did. You can learn uh, how to put it together and offer improvements that you see that as you're assembling it, you say, oh, this would make it easier, and then we put that on the wiki, and that becomes part of the next iteration, or at least part of the discussion for the next iteration. So you kind of get, you get, you get to learn how to put it together, mm -hmm. and you have a set of instructions on how to do that. That knowledge already exists, why, why reinvent the wheel in that knowledge? And then add to it, so you're spending your time improving the, the product. Um, and it may be improving the assembly process. Maybe you figure out an easier way to tension the belt or um, an easier way to put the motors together or whatever it is. Yeah. 
and you could add that to the process instead of say, making the same mistakes that have already been made and, and documented and solutions have come, been, been come up with to, to alleviate this. And that makes a lot of sense. Now, I think that creates a, lot, a good balance between the two. But then we've got to think, is that worth March's time to be up there building a 3D printer? Or is there anything else that would add more value to this experience that he could be doing? So then it comes to that question. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, here's, here's something that happened. Because we're, we're moving rapidly month by month through the versions, so I built the 11 or 11.18 or 18.11 printer at LIA with Margin. And then I came here in May and we built the 04 printer, I believe. But 1904. Then, yeah, the 1904, which is the April of 2019. Since then, several changes have been made. And so I was going on what I knew from our printer and then I came here and then I was running into unforeseen things. So that's and even a few little things like I never really learned the, the belt thing because uh, somehow we were a team and I never really did the belts back in London. I may have done one or two, I just didn't remember it. So then I was showing people all kinds of tricks yesterday. <laughs> Very creative ways to use the belts. <laughs> but uh, were they the most effective? Probably not. They work for me at home at the moment. My printer's been printing very nicely, but they're just not the ideal ways to get the belt working. And can yeah. I piggyback on that? And we came in and watched this video of like what is right now, I think, a pretty good solution. Yeah. Um, that knowledge already exists on how to solve that problem. So instead of resolving the problem over and over again, just learn it from somebody else. And then if you can find a better, you know, uh, a process or where to put something together, add that to it. And I think you had something to say too. Tiffany. I was saying, how much will I remember on my own? Like, how much will I remember Oh, by the way, did I say we have a 500-page uh, build manual for this printer? 500 pages. <laughs> Except it's, um, yeah, it is. The problem is it's but it's um, back, right? 18.10, which is our, call it kind of like stable release. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So you can follow just about everything in there, and it might be worthwhile to go to D3, uh, page called D3D Genealogy and look at that. It's actually 18... 18.10 is the, is the version. It does have everything like the axes, but there might be, okay, this screw is in a different way or something like that. You know, because the geometry changes very, just slight variations on how the axes are assembled, but the axis by itself, you can get everything about that from that guy. So uh, feel free to pull that up. Yeah. yeah. That's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I don't know where to go from here. <laughs> Do we vote or what? I, I don't know. I mean, I got as far as like thinking about what uh, uh, what questions to ask, and in a similar line, you know, how how we can improve the process, but open it up to the group, and then I stopped thinking about it because I didn't know, and I wasn't going to try and predict what direction this was going to go. So I I don't I don't know how to resolve what direction it wants to go. Um, uh, Who's for, who, who likes the assembly line idea? Like a pure assembly line? Yeah, I think maybe. We'll start with that. So a variation of it. Okay, the just like we're gonna. So right. so let's let's talk about scope in terms of scope. Mm -hmm. Like just like the 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 goal is to get them all done cool. as fast as possible. Okay. So yeah. and to the highest quality, you know. Yeah, you by by tomorrow afternoon. Or yeah. What's the by day? tomorrow. When was, when was our predetermined? We are supposed to finish them and have them running by the end of tomorrow. Okay. Now, uh, there's two things for that. One is the idea that you, you feel a great sense of accomplishment, and also they are the prototyping machines for the other machines if we want to do other things. So uh, remember those two things. Oh, I'm also curious about Martin's input. Yeah, that's... Uh, that's this. Uh, my input is that um, my overall conclusion is we do the swarm so that means we do one step at a time according to tight instructions so we do one step everyone does it first person done helps the people that are not done mm. I tried to to implement that yesterday by saying okay let's get to the two axes first person done helps everybody else we all get to the two axes nobody makes mistakes if they're caught at that time we're not propagating any other mistakes mm -hmm. like 
um, you know, like say the, the couplers on the motors, um, you know, we can catch all of that on the, on the Y axis and we wouldn't have to do, redo five, we're redoing up to two and only a small section of the two. So that's why I try to enforce it. It failed. Uh, and actually, I would like to know why um, why we didn't do that. Like that's that's an open question. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm saying why we did not do that. I remember you saying that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But my interpretation is that like when you're done, then help other people. So yeah. I interpreted it as when you're done with your center. No. no. Yeah. yeah. I'll do I it. remember specifically the two axes, like having your two yeah. y axes done and mounted, yeah. and then go see what everybody else is doing. And, and I didn't hear that. Now, yeah. I would point out that I think you made a good point, Raina, that um, having somebody just like come over and step into your workspace about what you're doing, because each printer I think is a little different at this stage, and understanding the problems that you're having and then being able to assist in that difficulty, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that I experienced was that the instructions you gave at the beginning seemed enormous. Like, I didn't know what half of the words you said meant. Like, I didn't know which parts, part, parts were which. Um, mm -hmm. Like, the, I wasn't sure which axes were the Y axes. And there was a further complication of having multiple people on a printer meant that it was inefficient to try to work on exactly the same thing at the same time, which in fact may be a thing we should think about if we, in, in whatever uh, process we choose uh, going forward. Uh, it meant that I, like I think we had three people in our group, and so somebody I think worked on the Y axis and maybe somebody else worked on the X axis and I worked on the Z axis. Um, and then when things weren't, uh, when I wasn't sure what to do, I just looked at the thing and I saw what wasn't, what we hadn't done yet, and I start working on that because I wasn't sure whether or not we'd fulfilled the requirements for uh, get done with X Y Z. Ideally, because we said two Y axes, <clears throat> according to Scrum methodology, it's like pairs pair up, so that one person could do one and one person could do the other. And learn from each other and help each other. That would have been the ideal situation. That wasn't made super clear yesterday, but at any time you try to break down and, but at the same time help each other, uh, and then first team done helps other people. Yeah, like maybe if having three people in the group may have con confounded things a little bit more, but it might have been useful to say, okay, one person do one y-axis and the other person do the other y-axis. Even, even still going forward, it, I feel like it might be better if we do like even down to a single carriage at a time. Like you hold up a carriage, you put this thing here, and you put these screws here. Um, or even in fine detail, I don't know, maybe we'll have to play it by ear. But uh, that's my thoughts. So what do you guys think about just working longer? Good ask. So maybe uh, two things were clearly added in my mind. One was. Um, the inefficiency of getting parts and you know, having to turn that one. And I think if we solve that problem by this morning, um, the availability of Martin and, and uh, William to actually just move around and see where we're making critical mistakes and assistance. I think we relied on them yesterday, that QAQC aspect, to be getting things for us, to finding things for us. So I think if they're more available, just to do that, it can minimize our mistakes. We can definitely do that. Let's uh, get like the tool pack and parts set, like really clearly specified. I mean, and for the step that we're doing. So we're saying by the by lunchtime, let's just worry about those parts because the whole thing is you know it's a big deal. So I, I really like the idea that the challenge me to test the powers of my observation, to look at this thing and try to figure out. And, and, and that contributed to deeper learning than if I were to just get a, a set of instructions. But I think that would help different people have different places. But I just like that I have to think deeply, I have to look carefully. But even despite that, if I'm making mistakes, it would be helpful if somebody would point it out, and then we would move faster. Um. There's just a little reflection on the things that came up yesterday. Put up on the 
the screen here the things that I've seen that were considerations it's good to know before you start assembling any one axis. This is based on the Y axis. So here's a list of parts and each part has a little note beside it as to what you may have to think about. So there's the idler pulley. Uh, there are two little parts to that. Well, finding them was a good thing. I eventually found them. Someone showed me where they were. They were, they were being hidden under some other things. Um, the idler brackets. So are there nut catchers in there? Yes or no? Some cases yes, some cases no. Uh, so we need to know that. Uh, carriage brackets. We have the wide. Oh yeah. The large, full or half. So each, each axis is it a full or half carriage bracket. Now, one of the big things is where's the orientation of the slots for the belt? First of all, I've seen it like when I made it a few times back in London, we reversed them so it was not going to work at all. So first they line up and then are they going to go on the top or bottom? It could be partly aesthetic as to whether you want them on the top or the bottom. I don't think it really matters, but maybe there's a reason that no, you know, it doesn't no. matter. As long as they're going to line up. And so then we go down to the motor brackets. The motor brackets hold the motors on. Are there going to be nut catchers in there? Yes or no? Uh, I don't even remember if they have them or not, but just keep that in mind. So motor, uh, this is one thing. I tried to line it up by eye yesterday. It didn't work. Uh, so then the process is you take a tape measure and you put it down and let the little gear go down so it's slightly off the bottom of the motor. It's not going to be grinding against the motor. And that just lines the motor teeth up, the gear teeth up with the belt. If it doesn't line up, it's not going to work nicely. So then the motor orientation. This is something we won't see until later, but I found it makes a difference as to whether you're going to have cables sticking out the side of the printer and then looping back around. But if you carefully consider where the orientation of the motor is and observe the 3D printers carefully, you have a 25% chance of getting it optimum the first time. It's not going to be a make or break thing, but it makes a difference as to the overall organization of the printer later. How are you going to orient the cables coming out of the motor? So there are four. So, yeah. I think this is great. I think it's a little uh, too detailed for the discussion at hand. I think we yeah. should use this going so, forward. But this is something we can use good... today. But I, I wanted to put this because maybe there's some even things that I missed. But anyway, this is a good discussion we should have. And we should have a list like this for each of the three axes. Plus the some of the other things. And I'll put this up on the wiki. And then we can edit it. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. exactly. it can work in your hand as yeah. we were talking about it. Yeah. So, so that will actually help us to picture what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, John? I just wanted to say on what he was saying about visually seeing it and it teaching him a lot. Like, I enjoy that as well. Now, when you throw it there as a net catcher, mm -hmm. it triggers something in my mind that when I'm putting something together on the model, there are net catchers. So I put mine in there, and then when I go after it goes after it, like, oh no, that's not needed, then I have to go back and take it apart. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily, if they're in there, no one's going to notice. Okay. But it's not so going to... Like, the yeah. aspect is, because I'm like, okay, well, I'm on visualizing it and seeing it, like, it's there for a reason, so I'm learning things that are unnecessary, if that makes sense. Because I enjoy it also, visual aspect. Mm -hmm. okay. So more to yeah. question before I get into this. Uh, Ideally, for us to hit our goals in terms of getting it finished, what needs to be completed today? Uh, frame. We got axes, heated bed, uh, not heated bed, controller. Okay. I think it's doable because the controller pending, I would really suggest one step at a time for the controller. Everyone gets checked. Uh, also, because there's a placeholder for every single component on the controller. So Bam. Just don't go into a corner, work with everybody, do step by step, because it's also enough complexity in there that... Cool. cool. Yeah. So what, what I do, how I solve problems in, when it comes to this sort of thing is, is there's one variable that we're not taking into consideration, I feel like, and that's the time. Like, we're, we're rushing, and the reality is we have a lot of time. So what helps me is making commitments to finish things, regardless of where the sun's at. So I, I would challenge anybody to, to follow suit with this. You don't have to understand people get tired, but I, I'm going to make a commitment today that I won't leave the workshop until that aspect is done, no matter what time it is, so that we do hit our deadlines and that we do hit our goals and that we can all learn at our own pace. We just stretch the day out a little bit more, uh, if need be. And that's, that's my commitment, and that's how I'm going to go move forward with this, is I'm just going to finish it no matter how long it takes. And 
for anyone else that wants to do that, like let's let's just run it like screw time. But that's for me that's not sustainable. And I think part of these workshops is to have a sustainable uh, uh, working culture. Um, and if you do that, then your printer's done. What are you going to do for the next day? Help everybody else out. Move around. That's filling in the gaps. Good. That's the idea. If you do want that, yeah. Yeah, there's different okay. levels of ambition and energy in a group. So that's, uh, you know, if John proposes that, it's absolutely, yeah, has, you know, kudos for that. Yeah, if you want to do it. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Oh. Mm. Well, I, I, think, I think the critical thing is. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh. Yeah. yeah. But th th I mean, does that not get into like the superstar problem? No, because it's voluntary. Um, the superstar, like, uh, superstar, is a person who works alone and thinks that they can do better, and they don't really help. Other people because they're too good, but John is not implying that at all. No, no. It's, He's it's, saying I'm going to help everybody as the core of my mission because he wants to put in um, most value to the system. Yeah. I don't he think that's a superstar forward, like, mm -hmm. thing. If, if he's doing what he says he's going to do, that's the commitment part. And oh, Ganesh. But, but I think we learned, <laughs> I think the most critical thing that John said in my mind is that we have to be able to accomplish our goals. You know, we've taken a lot of time, energy, expense to be here. And what would be crucially important for everyone is that we complete the yeah. printer on time. Yeah. And then we use that printer uh, to take the other machines. What, what would be undesirable on my part um, is that if we are not complete, if we are not able to, to print the parts mm -hmm. and do the other things that we are supposed to do. Agreed. See, I'm talking to the team. If you can't do what you're still doing, yes, do it, man. Talk to other people. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. It's not. It's not. I don't think we're going to get money on that. I'm not discussing that subject. And it basically sounds like we're going to continue working on our own ones. With, with, with the addition that will organize parts, yeah, yeah, parts which is a plus. You have a. Yeah. We have the trays, those those tan trays. Okay. Put all your stuff in there, your tools and your parts, and just for the defined point that we're saying well, we're going to get by lunch. So that's all the axes. Axes absolutely done. Axes and frame. So get all those parts in there, uh, all the tools you need to do that. Uh huh. We all get our Yeah. Yeah, but I don't know. Yeah, I think we do. We do. Uh, we do. We just need to pull them out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we, we do. We do we do have all the tools. We can make that happen. So part of that would be maybe spend just a little bit of time up front to pull them out. Um, and also hide all the yellow wrenches that don't work for uh, Right, right. Like, um, yeah, people start taking out all kinds of tools that weren't necessarily appropriate for this. Okay, uh, so can we do uh, a good, uh, I would say like 35 minutes on the general machine design part, so it's actual curriculum. Can we jump into that? And five minutes on meditation. We <laughs> start that. Yeah, cool. Yeah, sure, yes. Let's do it. So this is especially for the remote people who are still, we've got the crew, everybody's there, like we've got like 12 people or so. So please go to the, <clears throat> the design guide page, which is CNC machine design table of contents for the uh, CNC machine design lesson, which is like lesson number two or something. Um, we are here to learn design, how to design and build just about anything. So. One big part of that is CNC machining, which is the automated machinery that makes other machines. The other part is machines themselves, like tractors, brick presses, and 3D printers and houses. Those are all machines that can be created. But the most generative is the 
Universal Axis, the Universal uh, CNC construction set, which allows you to build just about any machine. So what does a production machine of this sort, an automated machine, look like? Uh, there's five elements to that. So on the, <clears throat> I'm going to page, I'm going to go to all, all that here. I'll share my screen actually for the remote viewers uh, because it's all uh, getting recorded as well. Um, what are the five elements for making a production yeah. machine like we are building right now? So just to step out and see how that applies to just about anything. So we've got a frame, we've got a motion system, we've got a tool head, we've got a, we've got a controller, and we've got the supporting infrastructure that makes that particular machine do what it needs to do. What page are you on? Page number two in the OSC design guide, CNC machine design. Mm -hmm. And I'm on <clears throat> item number one. So kind of go through that more briefly through some, um, more on others. So the survey of machines that we, we can cover briefly here is a 3D printer, a mill, drill, lathe, circuit, mill, router, torch table, laser cutter, water jet cutter, electric discharge machining, air bearing lathe. We'll talk about all of those because we're saying, okay, how do we have all these crazy variations from a basic system of five components that I just mentioned? It There's... If, if we not up on the screen yet. Yeah. So yeah, to follow this, um, yeah, I mean, we're talking here. It's also being recorded, so you can. I'm capturing the screen here. Uh, we do have some internet issue here. So one critical aspect, and that's the essence of the universal axis, is the precision motion. So that's what we have with the universal axis. Using the current system right now, we get 10 micron resolution from the axes that we're building today. That's using standard stepper motors, uh, using pulleys like we have, <clears throat> and micro stepping on a control of the actual stepper motor. The stepper motor is what gets you the precision. The current system that we have, which in our sleepwalking, we can get down to 10 microns. What is stepper motor? A stepper motor is um, is an electric motor. Where is it found in the machine? So you just the machine. The five, five motors. motors. Oh, five. Those are the five motors. Yeah. 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 Stepper yeah. motors. Yeah. Stepper motors are they have uh, magnets in them and they cog. They kind of cog at a very precise angle. And there's um, what is it? 1.8 degrees per cogging. But they can also. So that means if it's 360 degrees in a circle, that's 200 steps that they have per one revolution. And you can control that exactly. I mean, they always end up in the same place. They're, that's what they do. And you can also, by the, using the controller, you're allowed to go in between those steps, down to 16 micro-stepping. So if you do some mathematics on that, you look at, well, we're spinning this motor, we've got a pulley on that with a belt, and you're dividing one revolution into 200 parts, and then further to 16 parts. So 200 times 16 is what? Amen? 3,200 3, steps per revolution that you can get down. So you're breaking down this uh, drive gear, which has got about a one or two inch um, distance around for one turn. So it's pi times its diameter, the diameter is only half inch, so it's about 1.5 inches. But you're essentially breaking 1.5 inches by 3,200, and that's what you have for the the basic basics of the precision here. If you do those numbers, that turns out to 10 microns, or about one half of one thousandth of an inch. That's pretty good. Wow, that's that's good. That's awesome. <laughs> So we start with that, and those are off-the-shelf components that you could get for $8. That's how much the stepper motor that we have today uh, working with on a standard printer costs. In a bill of materials, you can look at the 3D printer BOM on the wiki. That's a great start. Uh, we can control that motion using very inexpensive controllers, the universal controller that we have, which I'll talk in more detail later, uh, actually uh, in the afternoon session. But for very low cost, $8 for the component, the precision stepper motor, and then 
five dollars for an Arduino and ten dollars for the the board on top of that Arduino. So like, and including the screen and all of that, there's a thirty dollar packet you get for the screen, the controller, and then you need a power supply on top of that. But it's it's super accessible. I mean, think about that. It's uh, I mean, this kind of stuff would be thousands and thousands of dollars a decade or two ago. Um, right now, it's open source accessible. It's awesome. And then we also have Marlin, the, the software that allows you to, to control machines very easily, like 3D printers. And you can also use Marlin for any other machine. So, so that's, that's the idea of the uni universal controller. You can modify Marlin to run not only a 3D printer, but any kind of 2D or 3D motion system, which is awesome. Uh, Scott is uh, one of the lead developers he just commented I posted on my Facebook he said yes you guys are building more printers well thank you for Marlin so that's how it works uh, people are uh, contributing to the common pool of open open know-how Marlin for example is an active development so you have some advanced features such as for example um, the fact that you're probing the bed automatically to get exactly what its level is so you can adjust while you're 3d printing uh, you can completely adjust. If you have a bed that's a little wavy, it will follow that bed, which, yeah, that's that's one of the features of Marlin. It's, it's an amazing piece of software, very simple, accessible. You can download it off the internet right away and so forth. Okay, so that's the precision drive. We've got uh, half a thousand or 10 microns. And if you build larger machines, if your drive sprocket is, is maybe larger, then you may, ha you know, say it's like, one inch or two inch drive sprocket, and you know you have correspondingly less accuracy there. But if you do a gear down, then you can have that initial direct drive stepping. Like that's just direct drive on a belt. You're stepping at, at those 3,200 divisions. Uh, but if you put a gear down next to that, you get correspondingly more accuracy. So so you can really scale this, and for scalability purposes, with a gear down. <clears throat> and the concept of power, you can take even that tiny stepper motor and you can connect that to a rock crusher. You have enough enough gear down, and that's so one of our sessions was about gear down, so we'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, if you go through the math, you can crush a hundred pounds of rock in a day, which is crazy. So gear downs, uh, you want a big machine, do some gear down. You don't necessarily have to go to a bigger motor. You can, and, and you can, you definitely could do that. But the question of, of rate, like production rates is important. Like, what do you need to do? If a machine is automated, um, you can't accept the fact that it goes slow unless your, your goal is absolute maximum production. But in terms of just reaching, like, huge powers, huge torques, and ability to do some heavy-duty stuff, you can do that with smaller components if it's automated. That's one of the concepts we're saying is, um, which, which also makes solar energy feasible much more in the distributed world scenario, um, you can have huge torque and forces by using even small components, but it's going to take longer. So you have very low wattage, which is power. Uh, power can be low, but force is not like power. Force can be infinite from a very low power device. So this is, uh, it's a, this is another lesson, of, uh, one of the 18 lessons. I'll talk more about basic calculations and what I call numeracy, like physical numeracy. Like how do, uh, how do you count the physical phenomena out there, essentially. But that's an interesting concept because um, when you think like that, you can say, oh, we have new options in terms of how we can do things if we don't assume that, oh, it's about maximum throughput in a minimum time. That's the current industrial model that works. We can do that. You know, we can do large things and big engines and big tractors and bulldozers, but you can also have low power things that are very functional but work slowly. Like, for example, a solar rock crusher would be a perfect application. You dump a load of rocks in there and you let one solar panel crush that over a day. You know, so it's low productivity but effectiveness is huge. You still get those rocks crushed, and you, but you, you know, low cost. Okay, so just, just concepts like, like that, that I think are important. So let's talk about, um, we we'll talk about five, one of the five components is the supporting infrastructure. So I'll focus on, on that aspect of 
what supporting infrastructure do you need for any of these given devices? Because you have essentially those five same components, <clears throat> but the tool head will be different, and the supporting functions necessary to make that tool head work are going to be different also. So what about, a, for example, a 3D printer? 3D printer, you're going to ha have a movie, so you've got motion, obviously. The tool head will spit out molten plastic or molten metal or whatever. Uh, absolutely anything from clay to anything else. What supporting infrastructure do you need for that? Well, in the case of, let's take the standard case of what we do for 3D printing, you're going to need a heated bed if you're going to have prints adhere to a surface very strongly. Uh, we're using, in the 3D printer, we're using a, an advanced plastic called PEI, polyetheramide, which has the property of when it's hot, it attracts, it, it holds the prints very well. When it cools off, they completely just pop right off. So that's a, that's a great thing. That's one critical aspect of a 3D printer. Another critical aspect would be if you've got automated operation, you, you have to get down to exactly the level of the first layer, the surface plate. And that, that's where you use a height sensor to make that happen. So on a 3D printer, for example, we have the height sensor as a critical com component to the system. Uh, beyond that, uh, you can have other specialized items such as like heated enclosures. So if you want to use less energy for a 3D printer, you can do heated enclosures. And then, al then also the print quality will be higher because things will tend to warp less. Uh, so heated enclosures are another good property of the system. Um, other, other elements. Part cooling. So you're not just spitting out molten plastic. In a 3D printer application, you also have a print cooling fan. And that's that you'll see on a 3D printer. It's that blower. It's that circular blower thing. That as soon as the, the 3D print comes, the molten plastic comes out, you don't want it to be liquid in that liquid state forever. So you cool it as soon as it comes out of the nozzle and it attracts to the layer below, you cool it so then the structure is really solid and you can keep building upon it. So that's one special, another specialized um, function, a support system. So I'm talking about the supporting infrastructure. Um, one, one that's critical for higher quality prints. You can go without it and you might get things that have less, less definition, less quality. Uh, another item is um, ventilation. Why? Because some plastics are nasty, like if you work with bioplastics, they're cool, like, like polylactic acid, PLA is a standard thing we print with. But if you're going to be printing with like ABS or PVC, they fume off and they're not good for you. So ventilation will be another system you'd need to have. So if you're, say, recycling PVC pipe from trash, uh, you want to do that in a place where you're taking care of the fumes so it has to be vented uh, or something like that. Uh, and there's definitely lots of material science issues and safety and all of that that we can develop to make different plastics that are as quality, have the right features, but also are non-toxic. So in, in history, typically what happens is you come out with a brute force method that is the easiest to do. And that typically is the most toxic. And then you go about going eco and evolving processes and, and then you find out, oh, we can actually do this clean, cleanly, and you go about doing that. And initially it's more expensive and that's the present state of the world is where a lot of the processes today are, might be nasty or polluting or destructive. But as time goes on, as we go into an ecological economy, then we go the extra step of being smarter and saying, okay, let's include uh, you know, the environmental sanity in it and we add those features into it. But typically what happens, you, you start with the dirty stuff and then you clean it up as everyone gets upset over that. So uh, plastics research would be one, one cool thing for material science to open source some of these farms. None of these plastics are really uh, open source. Like I don't know of any really feasible um, open source formula out there. You could do it. I mean, it's chemistry. It's some kind of apparatus and kind of a chamber where you add heat or pressure. Uh, that's like chemical engineering stuff. You got vessels, vacuums, heat and pressure, and you put a couple of molecules in one end and something else comes out on the other under these, these 
uh, forces of pressure and heat. Um, that is highly proprietary today, and it's definitely great work to be doing. This, this is DuPont, IG Farben, <laughs> for those IG Farben, <laughs> if you know your history. Um, uh, that kind of stuff is huge. Centralized industry today is pretty, pretty much in a proprietary sense, and, and environmentally, of course, they're being pressured to do things better and so forth, but it's all on a fossil fuel economy. And one thing about the fossil fuel economy is that everything you can do from coal and fossil fuels you can do from net present biomass. Once again, the, re the renewable energy economy, you turn uh, carbohydrates, hi sorry, hydrocarbons like CHOs, the, the cellulose and all that, you can turn that into, into carbon. And from carbon, carbon is, what's, is what coal is. So you have all the chemistry in the world, the, all the organic chemistry comes from plants. You don't have to have coal for that. That's uh, an aside here. But definitely worth pursuing because it's easier and cheaper to dig the coal out of the ground, uh, but also it's more destructive. Um, so let's, since um, I think printers are quite capable, there's a lot of different options you can do. So plastic is easy. Metal, you can use a metal, there's links actually in the document. So, <clears throat> so open source metal printers are already out there, experimental ones, not ones that are producing any parts, but there are commercial systems that have, that have basically welders. Um, basically a welding element that's moving around and creating a complex shape and that's called wire additive manufacturing uh, wire arc additive manufacturing wham um, you can also do for the plastic filaments you can also have certain filaments that, are, that have metal embedded in that so when you print that you can post process it so by baking it so that you end up with a hundred percent metal part now that's pretty cool they do have that kind of filament out there already Definitely would be worth open sourcing. That's pretty cutting edge stuff. Um, so there's no plastic off of it? Yeah, so you're burning out the plastic and the metal particles that are in there, they're, they center together into a solid 100% metal metal shape wow. in an oven. Yeah, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's very powerful. Uh, ceramics are a great thing to, to be printing. So you're printing clay, but then you have to fire that. Or you can actually do metal embedded ceramics as well, where you have metal powders. That's powder metallurgy. You have to get the powders from somewhere. Um, but you can have all the, the powder in the clay, and then you burn, once again, bake that, and you can end up with a metal part as well. Um, there's bioprinting, where people are printing biological materials, syringes. One cool thing is like embedding fiber or wire into plastic. So you would have two extruder heads, one that spits out the plastic and another one that has a wire, a very thin wire, like a welding wire, but thinner. Um, and it punches that into the print after the, the print head so you can get reinforced parts. So those kinds of systems are out there and to me that seems like probably this, this metal plastic or metal fiber composite, uh, sorry, plastic fiber, whether the fiber is fiberglass, carbon fiber, or hemp or whatever, um, you can get the properties, the tensile strengths of things like like glass fiber. It's intensely strong. It's as strong as it's just about as strong as carbon fiber. Uh, you can embed that so you can get high performance parts within plastic. To me, that's how car bodies and lightweight structural things like airplanes will be made in the future. Some already are done that way. That yeah. Help when you're building those step rotors, like because one of the things we did the other day, we saw that the rim was made out of plastic, so it gets less torque. Yeah. If you embed it with that stuff, can you get it as strong as the metal, or like a lot closer to it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say um, how how close to it, metal. Quite close. You can definitely get aluminum strengths. Okay. And if you're yeah, definitely aluminum type of strengths. Right on. So uh, I don't know about steel. But there's stuff coming out every day, like recently they've developed something like uh, a steel aluminum alloy that's got ins insane properties. Like, man, all kinds of stuff is coming out. Um, so we typically don't hear of aluminum and steel working together, but as we gain more control over uh, molecules and how they combine together, some people are doing this crazy stuff. So point being, like, all the time it's like, there's so many different options that are possible. Maybe just someone hasn't stumbled on it yet, 
but altogether we're in a stone age of innovation today so you can kind of see that whoa there's so much more possibility um metal clay metal clay i mentioned that yeah uh one one thing to to be familiar with is understand the feasibility of what the wire additive manufacturing can do so you talk about welding deposition rates because that's what that process is so if you can do large structures like i mentioned cell uh, towers for windmills hey that's perfect material for wire arc additive manufacturing the wire de metal deposition rates are pretty pretty big i think they're like up to 20 pounds per hour so think about a, a welder i'm looking at that welder wire today costs about a dollar 15 in bulk you can get that on ebay now that makes wire additive manufacturing not so bad as a real economically significant option there's a small percentage you need shielding gas and you need electricity but that's only like five percent of that cost um, but with that kind of deposition rate deposition rates are about 20 pounds per hour so yeah it's it's doable you can do some big things with that and some people are so if you click a link on um, and another page I've got no, I don't know but there's you can see for example amazing work like you've got robotic arms with welders on them and they're making bridges and other large shapes there's a company I think I have a link in there somewhere um, metal metal and I think it might be under oh yeah here the robot arm mx3d.com um, mx, mx3d.com yeah I mean you can look at that but they're building like building shapes uh, mx3d.com there's a picture of a robot building a bridge and then climbing on the bridge to keep building the bridge all the way across a uh, gully so but that's doable right now with open source let's get the robotic arm in place and uh, open source MIG welders that's doable so just look at some of the pictures mx3d.com it's quite impressive and also very much doable in the open source there's nothing particularly exotic about it it's like you got welders proven technology you got cnc motion which is proven technology uh, no fancy thing around it so that's a project worth developing um, okay let's keep moving keep moving to some other machines so mill drill lathe combo so in this workshop, we're, uh, we're aiming to build a two-inch universal axis super heavy-duty thing. And what is a mill drill and lathe? So at that point, uh, compared to a 3D printer, a 3D printer is known as non-contact machining. There's very low forces involved. However, if you're going to print super fast, there, there are large forces that come from acceleration because you've got a moving mass, the print head. So the physics works such as if you reverse direction or accelerate extremely fast from one one direction to another those forces could get huge so point being if you want to print super super fast you need a very solid frame that's part of the reason why we're doing the very solid space frames in our printer because we want to print really really fast standard print rates are at 50 millimeters per second um, we'd like to be able to do quite decent quality within 200 millimeters per second which I mean the thing just flies like you saw what you saw yesterday was 50 millimeters per second uh, think about four times as fast it really starts cooking and but then you'll see the motions the the jerk of that the acceleration and change in acceleration uh, produces huge forces actually so uh, in a limit you can have a tiny 3d printer if the if the head is moving fast enough, I mean the forces would be as huge as heavy duty machines. I mean because it's a, it's about motion and acceleration, uh, which also means that if you have a super weak frame, you'd also be able to print, but you just have to go very slowly, uh, so less performance. So the frame is very important. Now in the mill drill and lathe option, you have big forces to begin with. They're contact machining. You're actually taking a tool bit, like a mill milling bit or a drill bit or some kind of a cutter bit that's moving directly into metal and shaving it off. Huge forces involved. Force calculations 101. How much force is there? If you're taking off, say you're milling something, uh, the basics are metal, steel, 
It's about 50,000 PSI, pounds per square inch. In other words, in order to take a bite, to take a bite of a square inch chunk out of that, it will take you 50,000 pounds of force. It's a lot. Uh, so mills have to do take little bites at a time, and you can do back of the envelope calculations that say like if yeah. Is that 50 is that yield strength or tensile strength? Um, tensile. Uh, Ultimate pounds. Yeah, that's that's uh, compressive. I typically look at compressive strength, which is comparable. This is like hand waving stuff, but general numbers for for understanding the order of magnitudes here. Compressive strength is what I typically refer to here. Yeah. And you're going to argue that because you're a structural engineer. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so that's, that's why I asked because you say 50 KSI. I think 50 KSI yield, and I'm going to ask you where you get 50 KSI yield steel at for uh, a reasonable price. What's the, what's the yield strength of steel? Mild? Well, which yeah, one? Mild steel. Mild steel, 36, typically. Okay. So 36, I mean, but we're talking about orders of magnitude. So, so like 50 compared to 36, we're still, you know, Period, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I, you yeah. say 50 and I'm thinking 50 case. I use a physicist. Yeah, yeah. And then, <laughs> and then, and then compressive strength. We talk about compressive strength in concrete, but steel is tensile strength. Yeah. And yeah. it's pretty much the same compressive tensile for steel. Right, right. So, uh, comparable values, but yeah, around 50,000. Yeah. And we, of course, of course, we're, we're talking about like general. Uh, physics for poets and machines for poets, yeah, and <laughs> and uh, but but just to show you that you can in the back of your mind you can get a feeling for the kinds of forces involved. So if you're uh, you're, you're biting off with one inch like per rotation of a of a of a drill bit a mill bit let's say, well you're going to be spinning the bill bit fast and taking very tiny chunks. So say you're you're moving at like a thousandth, like, like a tiny tiny bit one thousandth per uh, revolution like on a one inch hull what's the force there going to be uh, if it's 50,000 psi <clears throat> you only took 1,000th of that so I'm dividing 50,000 by a 1,000 I get 50 pounds so to take off a one inch shard off a one inch hull give me 50 pounds and that bit is spinning really fast Hand waving arguments. This is like general back of the envelope, but gets you thinking about because always I think about okay, steel is about fifty thousand psi, thirty six mild steel. Um, how much is that? Like I want to join two things together. I want to put a bolt uh, through a hole. Like I want to know basic hand, back of the envelope calculations for what I can hold with that. Like if I'm building my tractor, is a one inch bolt gonna hold two pieces of steel together? Well, I kind of know that if I clamp that bolt head down really hard, uh, the limit will be actually the bolts breaking. And I know, okay, I, I've got like 50,000 pounds there. Can I build a, 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 an operator cab that's put on a frame with that or actually put the frame together with that? Yeah, uh, 50,000 is pretty good. Uh, it won't get you the, one of those bolts will not get you a very big machine, but I mean, just uh, you have to, of course, count how many bolts you're using, what the structure is, and so forth. But but you start getting an idea um, of how uh, what the kind of forces are involved. The mill drill lathe, that's the you know those are the the high force machines that you have to consider extremely strong front frames. Uh, if we're going to build the two inch axis here, we're planning on half by four, uh, like just like we have the printer frame where we're using uh, one eighth by one inch. Um, we're going to use half inch by four for the heavy duty frame and that will easily get you 200 pounds like the tool force the the normal tool force is about 200 pounds that we're designing for but you have to always kind of take this 10, 10x safety factor uh, but with that kind of steel yeah you, you can do 2,000 pounds comments just, just a 10x safety factor that's healthy yeah, that's real healthy. What? Are you kidding or are you serious? I'm being serious. I'm yeah. being dead serious. Yeah. 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 I mean, for bridges, we're at a we're at a factor of safety of like one point one five. Fire, one, one point five. five. That's on paper until they actually put it, <laughs> <laughs> put it together. These are what I'm telling you is back of the envelope stuff. So if you think like so, we're, I'm not an engineer and stuff like well, that. Well, I mean, <clears throat> okay, all right. No, uh, the idea is just to get. Um, Oh, that's that's called overbuilding. It's like Russian tanks or whatever. Yeah, you're not gonna die that way. 
but the idea is that if you have those very basic baselines, it right? It lasts forever, the way you design it. And then yes, and you can say, okay, I trust myself that I will go inside that machine and use it and not die. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily need that super high engineering. And in fact, engineering today is such that it's designed for low margins. Like I talk to the, you know, the Swagger shop, which is the metal fabrication shop. They say, oh yeah, the, the steel on those tractors keeps get, getting thinner and thinner because they're saving costs and, and optimizing mm -hmm. for very tight parameters. Well, if well, it doesn't hurt me to have a heavy tractor that I can recycle all the steel of, that's 100% sustainable. So anyway, just some uh, comments can I, about... Can I get in here? So one of the things that I really like, it's a quote from somewhere, I can't remember where, uh, but I reference it a lot when, when people ask about, well, you know, it's, it's just a bridge. Yeah. Well, well, you know, or it's just a design. But it, it, anyone, anyone in this room, I guarantee you can design a bridge that stands. Guarantee you. But you're not going to want to pay for it. Something that you're, like, so, like, an engineer, the other half of that quote is, an it takes an engineer to design a bridge that barely stands. Something that you actually yeah. want to pay for. Uh, so, I mean, we can use a 10x factor of safety, but you're going to kill yourself in your materials cost. You don't. Because you can recycle those. I mean, we, the tractor that we're building is uh, is designed just like that primarily. So we can use either quarter by four inch tubing, steel tubing, because at the end of the day, steel is a, a dollar a pound, so um, it's, it's not too bad. And then we can also use what we typically use is quarter by four and half by four steel tubing. And no, I mean it, it comes out quite affordable. So, but you uh, could make. What I'm saying is, you could make it more affordable. And you can reduce the size of the motors required to move those objects. Which you can reduce the power required as input. Yeah. It depends uh, across the now. If you it, for a car, absolutely. For a tractor, you want more weight because you want more traction. So, so it depends on what. It depends what on the thing. application for sure. But yeah. I mean, he was talking about bridges. So, yeah, bridges is if you can if you can, you can have that safety factor one point five, right? Then. You know, it's, it's going to obviously going to be, you're going to use less material, and you're going to have more profitability, which is just profit. Yeah, which, which is which is the point that you, you were making, it, right? No, it's not about profit. It's about you know that bridge has to be funded by a taxpayer somewhere. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, think yeah, it could be I mean, it could be private. I mean, it could be private. It's still cost. Less materials cost. Yeah, less materials cost. Yeah, I mean, the underlying thing here is. I was always talking about this deal of the 10,000 factor in solar energy. Of course, you want to be efficient, but you also be, want to be robust. Like an apple tree does not make one apple, which is sufficient to propagate itself. It produces 10,000 apples because it's robust. So if you follow biomimicry, uh, you can kind of say, oh, it's, it's okay to do that. And, and you don't want to go crazy. You want to go within useful limits. Uh, but I see that's a can of worms, so... <laughs> uh, yeah, just kind of as a middle ground, I'll say that, like, I, I see both the side of wanting to save on materials, but also the fact that as somebody who doesn't really know what they're doing, I'd, I'd much rather be right. safe than accidentally have my tractor explode and kill me. <laughs> the point is, you're talking about specialization, and we're talking about generalization, where if you robustify the design, you don't have to be as... as smart or as specialized to be able to manage it so it's about access versus um specialization like we're really like one of our core values is, okay make it absolutely accessible to anyone else in the world like a person with a small garage shop in the jungle they can build that tractor quite well and that's exactly what they did in peru uh, so so we once again with the uh, superhero versus uh superstar versus proud uh, let the crowds do it because altogether they'll then get all smarter and, and in theory the, the whole world goes up over the idea that oh you've got uh, special people carrying the knowledge and it doesn't spread as well because pe by people getting engaged in the agency aspect I think there's more to gain for society in general so that's kind of the, the basic design principle here and we apply it in the universal axis you'll see that thing is super inefficient on, on certain aspects but it's also something you can build and can mill you an engine, you know? So that's the, you have to look at those trade-offs uh, in the design process. Let's, let's, let's continue, because I want to yeah. cover yeah. 
cover here. So, so the supporting infrastructure for a mill driller lathe. Uh, you're definitely going to have to have a heavy duty uh, device for holding the workpiece because you're going to be ramming into that heavily with the, the milling bit or whatever bit you have. Uh, you also want to have part cooling, any kind of, uh, uh, you generate heat when you wear away metal, uh, so you want to have part cooling, a little uh, spray system that even water would work, like uh, there's lubricants that may work better. Enclosures and inert environments. So if you want to be milling things and and you want to keep it super clean, like sometimes if you want to preci precision mill something super um, super accurately, sometimes people do that under a controlled atmosphere so that you don't get oxidation, like especially if you're working with easily oxidizable metals. Um, another thing is another support system is enclosures. If you want, I don't know, fumes or whatever, say you're milling something and the parts get hot and um, enclosures are common. So definitely worthwhile for, for a heavy duty machine, especially, I mean, safety, safety too, of course, like if you have some bit breakage, you don't want that flying all over the place because there are serious forces involved there. Yeah, so let's move on to the next one, which is a circuit mill. <clears throat> you can click on a link for the D3D CNC circuit mill. That's a low force, fast kind of spindle design. So circuit milling is, is a very rapidly spinning small bit. That's uh, because you're, you're milling tiny, tiny features in a copper clad board typically for circuits, if you're milling circuits. It's lo relatively low force, so the same frame that we have for the 3D printer right now, We've used that with the D3D CNC circuit mill. Uh, the same thing will work because the forces are um, not a lot, a few pounds and maxim maxima of tens of tens of pounds, so it's quite manageable. Uh, for a router, if you're routing wood or aluminum, that's kind of the lower duty, lower lower force version of the heavy duty mill drill lathe. And for that, um, it's kind of like the same kind of frame that we designed for the torch table if we build it robustly like with a one inch axes and make them stiff enough you can do basic uh, routing not not super high performance but decent decent routing using the one inch universal axis with forces like you know 50 pounds maybe is it worth it to overbuild like the 3d printer or does that take too much energy to like so it can make everything heavier so it's like the type of equipment you use to build that, like, ten, like say a 10 by 10 would be used to build a 5 by 5. Does that, so it's just, it's a lot more sturdy. Does the energy that it takes to run it over, like, make it possible, make it useless to do that kind of thing? Somewhat. You have to be, be heavy enough just to hold the axes. The tool head itself is rather light. So whether you make the printer that we're doing right now, or one that's like a meter or two, you're still moving only that head. Uh, so that part, the XY gantry, can be just about as light. However, in the one meter version, you're going to get into issues with moving the bed up and down. So because that we have one bed like that weighs about like 50 or 60 pounds already for one eighth inch plate that's reinforced. And if you have a full big print on that, that's at 100%, that's going to be hundreds of pounds. So no, you have to reinforce that. Or another strategy where you're not moving the bed up and down, but you're moving the, the gantry up and down, which is much lighter. And that would be a, a favorable design for uh, depending on the situation you have. Um, but moving the tool head itself, no, you can make that very small. You can make that quite much bigger with the limit being the bending, bending of the axes under the length and weight of the tool head, especially when you're going really fast. So, so yes, you can do exactly that. You could even do like really long, it could even sag like quite a bit. Why? Like you can do even a visible sag like this. Why? Because you have automatic bed leveling. The, the printer with a sagging axis, you know, it's lower here. But then when it gets to these higher parts, because of the automatic bed leveling, it will just drop lower and still give you a perfect print. And so that's the beauty of the bed, automatic bed leveling. And it doesn't, like, so when it comes up and it shoots straight out, it doesn't tilt it up and create some kind of weird angle? 
plastic? Um, it's negligible. I mean, you have to take a look at the, the geometry. I mean, I'm talking about like long, like maybe okay. five feet or seven feet. It will, it'll sag like the axes we have will sag like an inch okay. or so. Less, probably less than that, but um, you can get away with that if you're doing very, very slow. Like if, you, if you've got like a low budget and you want, to, you want to print a five foot large size, whatever, a desk, and you want to do it on a low budget, you can do that. Just put a big nozzle on that print head and go very, very slowly using a machine that's in the, that doesn't have that structural integrity. You can go very, very slow and you'll still be able probably to do it. So, okay, circuit mills. Um, so the special elements of a, of a circuit mill is simply that you have some device for holding a circuit, uh, the, the circuit that you're, you're etching at the very beginning, you have to have very precise leveling. So you have to probe the surface very carefully, uh, which is found in Marlin. So that's doable. You can see people doing Marlin based CNC mills, circuit mills. Now we're talking about, um, uh, maybe like a hundred microns or so. Uh, the copper board may not be super flat, so you have to actually account for that. And the bed probing in Marlin is actually capable of doing that. So you, you would send down a probe, you probe a bunch of points, and it gets you the contour. And we're talking about something that looks almost like glass and flat, but if you were to mill a very tiny trench in it, just the thickness of the copper cladding on a circuit board, circuit boards are, are some epoxy thing with a thin layer of copper on it. The layer is pretty thin, uh, so you have to be, you don't want to go too deep into it, you want to just scratch it, so you have to have very tight control over the actual <coughs> bed leveling, the leveling of the surface at front, so that's like the main aspect of the circuit mill that you have to overcome, and you can do that in Marlin, or you can do that with the D3D CNC circuit mill, one of our guys, he did his own custom software to do the bed program, but Marlin I would prefer simply because we don't have to learn this other package you know put that all into one package uh, the idea being you get so much power so many different uses from it at a fraction of the learning curve which makes it accessible to the generalist so important concept um, for a circuit mill like that you also have to have absolutely dust handling that thing is going to spew out little particles of dust of epoxy and the copper it's going to go all over the place and coat everything, so that definitely needs some suction system or an enclosure to keep that all in, some, some vacuum system. I have heard that circuit dust is really bad for your lungs. Yeah, uh, because I think of the, the copper clad boards are epoxy with fiberglass, mm -hmm. so the fiberglass I think is the part that you want to s stay away from. For a torch table, so torch tables are larger devices. The stock steel that comes for a torch table is in the U.S. is four by eight feet, about two by three meters in Europe. Um, so those are larger machines have to be able to support the weight of the moving gantry over a large area. Uh, the critical feature there is some of the support systems that we like to have. When you cut steel, it will warp on you if you're cutting it with a flame, which is like an oxyacetylene cutter or even a plasma cutter or laser cutter. The thing will warp on you, especially when it's very thin. So one desirable feature is a water bed. That's a, a, the metal is put on top of a grate that's submerged on top of water so that it's being cooled constantly as it's being cut and therefore you get a perfectly flat uh, piece of metal. We noticed that, for example, with the brick press that we did, uh, some of the long, long thin pieces were warped up and that was half inch steel. So you definitely want to have a cooling mechanism uh, so that could be a water bed or even I would foresee like a sprayer like on a CNC machine where you're just pouring a little stream of water with a small pump like an aquarium pump kind of deal uh, onto the metal where you're cutting because when you're cutting you're talking about like 5,000 degrees flame um, Fahrenheit do what I haven't seen that actually anywhere, but, but I imagine it's quite doable and you don't have to have a big water bed, which is really heavy, so you could maybe save on a structure. Um, well, I mean, in a water table you have chemical reaction from underneath anyway, so um, yeah, haven't seen it. Um, now, other support mechanisms in there is if you have a big, typically you cut from flat sheets of steel, 
they may not necessarily be be flat they may be warped especially if they're old and been laying around so you definitely want to have following a mechanism to follow the surface so typically what they have is is sensors that sense the distance uh, in our case uh, we need to do something like that as well um, especially if you don't don't have a water table then you really want to have height following because first a small piece you can pretty much set the torch height then you can cut plate like a one foot or so big uh, but the tighter you have the control over the distance of the nozzle the cutting nozzle from the metal the better quality cut you're gonna get and that is like you got to keep that within like a millimeter or two um, relatively precise otherwise the cut quality goes down so in the version that we can build we can do uh, the probe that we have to do automatic bed leveling but that doesn't work for real time because it just takes the level up front within Marlin we have the capacity to do that with a little knob by hand and we can do that immediately here and that's a that's a decent first level approximation of an automated torch table the CNC cutting is automatic but the control if you need it you can manage that with an operator so the operator has to be there if you want a really good cut um, so you're still getting the speed of cutting because you're not measuring anything and and so forth but you have to have an operator there but typically an operator is around the torch table anyway so it's not necessarily an extra thing it's doable uh, the optimal thing is to get a live feedback system put into Marlin uh, I don't know does anyone Aiden, you know if that exists in a live feedback system for bed leveling they do that all at once Oliver, up front Oliver from Germany wrote that into his he had a that program he wrote yes. Had a live feedback yes we do have uh, actually an open source version of the controller that one of our guys did design that has the live feedback but it's not Marlin based I'm trying to say okay let's throw that into Marlin so we do just one package That's and yeah um, that's software people so anyone who's a software guy help us get live feedback on Marlin so you can do automatic but here's the thing. Why real life why don't we just have the Z height only controlled by that program why do we need why can't we just why do we need Marlin to control the Z you don't so you can break it up in modularity exactly. we don't need so we just disable that in Marlin and then use that program that you wrote that's it. Well, except we never tested the probe and the whole capacitive sensor stuff. That requires some calibration and tuning, which we never got to. It is, it is. We've got a fully open source uh, automated height controller and a nice circuit, fully in the free CAD and, and key CAD. It's really good. It's really good. Um, so let's move on. So um, for the torch table, other support systems, if you're cutting thick slabs of steel, I mean, those things are going to be really heavy, so the structure has to be there to hold that metal in place. Uh, you also want to have, when you're doing uh, oxy fuel cutting, gas control. If you're doing a cut of a hole, you don't want to keep the flame on when you're moving to another hole. You want to turn it off and then ignite it again. So, so auto gas shut off and auto ignition, so a little spark igniter. Those kinds of features you definitely want to have in there. Uh, so laser cutter laser cutters so how fast is a torch table I can tell you 20 inches per minute for half inch steel you know like kind of slow not super fast uh, so you don't need a super fast motion system you need more the ability to hold a torch the weight of a torch and its cables and all that uh, so not hugely intense on any like uh, engineering requirements, just a very basic motion system, just like for a CNC, small CNC router. Uh, now for a laser cutter, lasers can move pretty fast, especially if they're engravers, which means you're just drawing, like etching things or drawing things on, on materials. Uh, those move much faster, so you need a fast moving kind of a gantry system. Um, and for the laser cutter, you definitely need a, outside of your standard motion and frame, you need ventilation because when you cut things, you're going to off-gas. 
safety enclosure, there the safety is critical because laser beams can hurt you and they go into your eye, they, you go blind. So, and then also one useful feature is you can do assist gases in laser cutting. So if you have a regular laser, yes, it will cut things. But if you shoot a stream, for example, of oxygen, directed oxygen, it will help blow this stuff out and be, and be able to be much more capable of making cuts. So that's another system that would go into a, a laser cutter. Um, so these are all systems that have XYZ gantries. You can have also rotational motion in there. Water jet cutter. Uh, I bring that up because there's actually, a, you can go, there's a link on point seven e How to design your own water jet cutter. A guy built one from like a compressor pump and stuff. Now we have hydraulics, which with hydraulics, they have pretty high, high pressure. Uh, so you can extend the capacity of our hydraulics to, to water jet cutters. So think about a five inch cylinder that's got 20,000 pounds of force. Uh, an easy way to, to go about this is get another uh, you can have cylinders that go up to very easily to 5,000 psi. So say with that cylinder, you're pressing on another small cylinder that's rated, rated for high pressure, so you get mechanical advantage. So with, uh, for example, if you, if you press with a 5-inch cylinder, which is naturally at 2,000 psi, that's standard operating pressures for hydraulics, 2,000 psi. Uh, you press another cylinder, say a 2-inch cylinder, you multiply that force in terms of pressure by a factor of five. Uh, no, not five, it's pi r squared, it's by the area of that. So already from 2,000 PSI, you can get several factors of that to like 10 or 20,000 PSI, but missing link there is, is the hydraulic cylinders that do that. I'm saying, how do you do this with off-shelf common parts? You can get up to 5,000 very easily using common off-the-shelf hydraulics. You need uh, high pressure, not um, high pressure fittings there, and a little bit of special. So what you're doing with a water jet cutter, it's water. Could be just water. Typically, they have an abrasive powder in there. But I'm trying to say here that with the existing hydraulics that we have, we can generate 5,000 psi streams of water. Uh, the example of the how to build your own water jet cutter on YouTube, they have like I think about 1,000 PSI, and they're cutting aluminum that's like eighth inch thick. Wow. Very cool. So if you have five times as much, you can do a little more and, and do a super dirt cheap uh, water jet cutter. The expensive parts are gonna be the nozzles, they're high, high pressure um, things that will be several hundreds of dollars, but you can get away with doing one for, for a couple of thousand dollars uh, using hydraulics. Um, that's, think about that, look at that video. What happens, I have a question, what happens to the, the, the steel in the curve of the cut, is that, is it um, like atomized? It's like, think, yeah, 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 it does, it's very tiny, so think about basic physics, it's like you got little bullets, little bullet hits a particle, it knocks it off, like, few atoms, I don't know how many atoms, maybe a hundred or a thousand atoms, maybe a million atoms at a time, I don't know. Um, so yeah, it's like a bunch of tiny bullets uh, hitting a solid surface, Does but it, it's, it's pretty amazing. Do you have to treat, treat the water afterwards? Does it have, is it easy uh, Depends what you're cutting. So if there's contaminants in the metal, like if it's just plain steel, I mean, whatever's in the steel will go into the water as well. So yeah, you have to get rid of the water. If you're cutting paper, you'll just get Cutting like wood, you get little wood chunks in, in the, in the, the water. Was that oxy fuel was like the appropriate technology because of its availability. Oxygen is something in you know, natural pattern. I'm just wondering if, what the thinking is in terms of the well, I would steel cutting and appropriate technology. Yeah, appropriate technology for steel cutting. I wouldn't go oxy acetic, I would go oxy hydrogen. And, but why I say the laser, the, the water jet cutter is because you can cut non non metals. That's the deal. If you want to cut steel, oxyhydrogen, for anything in a flexibility of a very precise cut that's higher precision than than the oxy fuel. Yes. You mean laser won't do it? Laser will do it. You got you need a fat expensive laser. 
we can open source those. There's, those are not open source, but you can do. You can build yourself an open source carbon dioxide laser tube relatively easily. It's not too advanced. You can go to, you can Google. Uh, there's one good website. It's got all this info. But you, people make their own laser tubes for carbon dioxide lasers. You can breathe into it and run off your breath. It will be very inefficient, but it will work. It will be magical to see it. Um, all doable stuff. Once again, when you demystify this technology, uh, you'll see how it's feasible. I do think that with 3D printing, like some of the mounts for optics and things in a laser cutter, you can help with that. So, and you can do as simple as a PVC pipe, because the uh, it's under vacuum almost. So there's um, if it's a low power thing, it'll take the heat. People make lasers out of carbon, uh, out of uh, PVC pipes too. Would that be on the same scale as the laser diode? Um, no, it, it, the cool thing about, well, scale, power scale, right now the laser diodes are getting extremely powerful. So they're as good as your carbon dioxide labors, lasers and stuff. So, yeah, that semiconductor technology at that point, which is different. Because carbon is just a gas that's available and you need some mirrors and carbon and a high voltage arc. Uh, old technologies. For the diode lasers, that semiconductor clean room technology, that's much higher tech. Okay. Like any microprocessor. Yeah, yeah, like uh, the clean room technology at that point, which <clears throat> with the next topic, the air bearing lathe, you can get to that technology. So if you click, so point nine, air bearing lathes, look at that video, most amazing. Dan Gelbart, if you haven't seen it, he's got 18 lessons. Hey, we have 18 lessons too. That's what a coincidence. That guy is the man. He, he teaches basically like shop class for university people, but it, he goes through a lot of basics. And at the end, he's got um, he's got a video of how to make an air bearing lathe. And what's an air bearing? It's an air bearing that does not rely on on friction of metal on metal, or like grease, like like a bushing on a shaft. Like we're we're gonna use bushings, ball bearings. Their physical contact of metal on metal. Uh, air bearings are where the contact surface is the gas between the metal because the metal is so precise that it, that in between it, it never touches it, e each other, like a shaft inside a tube. It never touches the walls because there's air, like a tiny, tiny layer of air. The air is, a, those are molecules. You can't go through them. You can't touch by pr machining that down to one micron accuracy, which is 10 times as precise as what we're talking about for the state of art of what we can do with the universal axis. So we're, we said 10 microns for the universal axis positioning. This goes down to smoothness of one micron. How do you do it? Well. The problem with machining is that when you touch something, you put a force on it, so you don't do it with, with standard machining. It's, it's a grinding machine, grinder-based machine. So a precise motion system using granite. The most precise systems out there are flat slabs of granite, which you can get for like 50 bucks on eBay. They're precise to a fraction of a, of a micron. So you use that as a frame. No longer do you use our universal axis frame <laughs> unless you want to make the standard frame that we do out of granite, but that's, that's not so practical. Take a big slab of granite, plop your motion systems on that, so you get the super high precision there. And you're going to need more than a universal axis belt, you're going to need precision ball screws, like more precise motion. Uh, and then you have a grinder grinder blades like on the grinders we're using with a metal cutoff wheel. Uh, just a precise grinder wheel that gets you to that kind of precision. And that's pretty insane because a grinder, it wears out when you machine things. So you kind of have to know what you're doing there. But, yeah. <laughs> But the cool thing is you can watch that video and you can see how basically the details of, uh, of an air bearing lathe. So it's a lathe. It's a spinning thing. Uh, you put something in a chuck and you put a grinder to it and the thing spins in the chuck and the grinder just very lightly wears away material from it to get this extreme intense precise thing. Yeah. 
Um, now, how do you do internal holes for that super precision? Well, it's a small grinder on a little spindle, so it goes inside the hole. So the hole has to be bigger than you can fit a grinder in there. But he shows the example. He made this the cylinder, uh, cylinder that goes inside uh, another pipe. He puts that in there, and it's got a closed bottom, and then he spins it and just spins forever. No bearings, like it's it's metal against metal. Hmm? Right. It won't if it's closed on the bottom. It won't hit the bottom because it compresses. The air does not leak out of it. The molecules are too big for for them to leak out of one micron precision, or they leak out very very slowly. I'm sure the the molecules are less than one one micron, so they will leak out, but. For practical purposes on the time scale, that's you can have that thing spinning for like a long time. That's how you make jet turbines and stuff like that. You you don't have ball bearings in jet turbines. You have air bearings because they're pretty fast spinning and high force. So you can get super high force, super fast speed for uh, space age technology that way. Um, yeah. So maybe I'll I'll end up with I, I talked a little bit about electric discharge machining. Um, nah, I won't get into that, but a plotter, like a plotter, universal axis plotter. Plotters are useful, I want to bring that up because you can draw little pictures, but you can also use a plotter to say you got to measure out your steel, put it under a plotter and, and get your get your hole pattern onto steel as a low-tech way to do it if you're going to drill. So if you don't have a CNC torch table or you want to drill in other things than metal, make hope, very precise holes on a wood surface or anything or plexiglass or whatever, a plotter is very useful there. It's an XY drawing thing with a little pen or marker, and you can draw precise things. Very use it would be very useful for marking out complex geometries at very low cost. It's just two universal axes cross and they move and back and forth, and you can draw pictures. Um, so there, the the supporting infrastructure is is just a pen holder, a plotter. A, a marker holder. It's a flexible thing because you have to be exactly on the surface. It's a flexible thing. It just rides on and draws. Uh, we haven't built one of those yet, but uh, open source little pen holder. I think you might find a design out there. We haven't built one, but very easy application of the universal axis for a very practical function. Okay, so that kind of summarizes summarizes most of what I wanted to cover. Further resources, uh, on, there's not much there, 10 further resources. If you click on that link, definitely go to the Dan Galbar DIY Air Bearing Lathe and his uh, 18 lessons. That's a really good good thing. And there's plenty more things we can add to that. If you find useful links and resources, please put them up there. Um, but start with Dan Galbar if you want an awesome crash course. Uh, we want to invite that guy for our next workshop. I want one have him do an air bearing lathe workshop. That would be awesome. Okay, any questions on anything? Uh, any questions from the remote crew? And well, I'm sorry, I, I do believe we cut out it here and there, but this is recorded. Uh, yes, you do have access to those docs. Um, and that's an email I sent out, so just please take a look at that email uh, for the current document. Um, <clears throat> High power diode lasers, yes. Um, <clears throat> EDM, so electric discharge machining, it's a wire that's energized in a bath of oil. A wire that spins between two, it's like a, think of a bandsaw. It's got a blade. Instead of the, the band, do a tiny, tiny wire and send high voltage through it. What's that do? Uh, that acts as a, an electric bandsaw. It, it does little tiny sparks. It's called electric discharge machining. It's doable in open source quite well. There's a whole bunch of you know YouTube videos on that. But you have an energized wire in a bath of oil, something that is not conductive, and you submerge the metal in it, and you can get super precise cutouts of any thickness. Put a, like a three-inch slab of steel and cut out a very precise thing in there. Holes. Um, or straight lines. It's, it's like a super precise bandsaw that does any metal, any conductive metal, by, by sending very tiny sparks 
because it's energized. Doable in open source. The wire gets eaten away. That's why it's a large spool that, that kind of spins between two spools and you can reuse it maybe a couple of times. Um, yeah. Uh, you can reuse it with lower quality, so depending what quality you want, but the precision on the initial run, I mean, yeah, you get, I don't know what exactly, I forget what the exact numbers are there, but they're like close to precision machining quality. I mean, it's pretty good. So, EDM machines, uh, interesting. Yeah. Are we going to get into principles for scaling down to their quiet, to finer, quieter machines? as well as for scaling up. Well, yes, the, the air bearing lathe kind of gets you to that because with that you can make photovoltaics and semiconductors. Those are tiny machines. Finer and quieter machines. Yes, quieter, like for example, for the, the universal controller, the latest printer has silent stepper drivers that are quiet, so you can't hear the machine run, actually, which is really cool. Uh, does that kind of answer the question? You can go either way. You can go up, but scalability does not mean scaling up. Scalability also means scaling down. So if you, for example, think of uh, the universal axis, we started at 8 millimeters because that's really practical. But what if you want to have a tiny, even a more tiny thing? Well, there's no reason why you can't build something that's even more tiny. Um, so you can go either up or down. And when you go tiny, then the question actually becomes physically handling those parts. Uh, for scaling up, it's about the heaviness, but for small things, it's at the end of the day, you have a hard time actually holding the little things. Um, that's the challenge there. Yeah. Yeah, so for example, for 3D printer nozzles, yeah, there are limits uh, both up and down. There are limits. But when we say scalability, we say basically anything that the industrial system currently does. Um, there will be fundamental limits. Like, for example, once you get down to 0.15 of a millimeter on a 3D printer nozzle, it gets extremely difficult. The standard is 0.4 millimeter nozzles. We're going to put 0.8 millimeter nozzles on ours because we want faster, larger prints. But the fundamental limit is not, it's, nothing is fundamental. You can always go below it. But practical limit, it would be like 0.15 that you can, I think you can still get 0.15 nozzles. But then your filament has to be so pure, like any contamination will jam your nozzle. It's much harder to feed the filament through because you have to have much more precise control. So whether you go up or down, you're going to get into constraints. For example, if you scale up, like if you have a huge nozzle, like, like one inch, and you're melting, well, what's the limit to that? What is the limit? Well, I mean, you, first of all, you're going to have like big, yeah. Yeah, like the bars of film, and you're gonna need a tractor to lift them. Like that's gonna be, be like pretty impractical, um, for an average person. <laughs> right. So yeah, you can think of up and down. There will be uh, constraints. Uh, for the scaling up with metal, that will be a constraint. Like the heavy duty machine, when you go to the heaviest, heaviest ones, some people do them out of concrete because you can get huge weight and stiffness from concrete at 10 times or more lower cost. Because what you need for a heavy duty machine is a very, very stiff structure. Concrete is very cheap and very strong. So people do make concrete bed machines for reasons of cost and performance. So you kind of have to look at the situation for the respective thing you're working with and think about what are those fundamental limits there. It will be power usage, material properties, cost, what you can handle physically, because if it's too big you just can't work it, uh, both large and small, um, amount of heat that's involved, and other things, pressures involved, um, 
power required to run something naturally. Yep. More questions. What is the timeline for this small aluminum part machine machine looking like as of now? Small aluminum part machine. It's already done. The CNC circuit mill can do small aluminum parts. Uh, so you can currently download the design and actually make use of it. So yes, that machine is capable, but we've never run it as such. We've never um, just done it. You have to do it and you have to document it. We've, we've just never done it. It's doable. Um, make screws. That Okay, making screws. We talked about it. Screws are a fundamental technology. We use a lot of them because it's, it's suitable for design for disassembly. You can put something together with screws and you can take it apart. And a one inch bolt has at least 50,000 pounds of clamp force. Very strong. It's more than that. Um, so we want to make our own screws and we do have the machines that do that. So we have the induction furnace to melt metal. We have the rod and wire mill in the set that rolls that into tubular things. And we have the metal rolling, hot metal rolling, which gets you flats. So those things get you the raw feedstock, say tubes, and then you can machine those on a heavy duty CNC mill drill lathe. And th those things are called screw machines. So a screw machine is a thing that has a lathe element to spin something, and it might have other heads on different angles. And you can add, if you have the universal axis, you can make any number of additional machining functions on a machine as such. So think of a big spindle and then other tool heads that can come into that from different directions. You would like to have automatic tool change to use different bits for different functions, like if you want to drill a tiny hole in a feature. So take, take a look at our extruder for the 3D printer. It's a fine, precisely milled piece of uh, aluminum. It's got a bunch of holes and threads in it. You can do that by setting up a machine, a screw machine, which can automate all of that so you don't even have to touch it. You, you put in stock, you feed stock through the, the lathe head. Like say it's round stock. For OSE, we're gonna have one inch and two inch round stock that's very practical because we use that all over. Uh, when we think about metal melting, we think about going up to three inch, uh, what do you call those, billets? So straight from the induction furnace and metal, hot metal processing, you get three inch billets, you can put them in a screw machine, you can smooth them out into perfect rods, or you can use those perfect rods to make any kind of a, a part. So say, think about a three inch bool of, of metal, you're feeding that through a lathe kind of chuck with an open center from the back, that's fed automatically, you machine like whatever you gotta do on it, and you chop it off, there's your part, there's your extruder. So that's uh, kind of the general principles for the screw machine. But yes, we, bolts are a great thing to do with that. Now, my impression was that uh, some of those machines haven't been built yet, right? Like Most of them haven't been built yet. Okay, just Yeah, we don't have any of this. Okay. <laughs> we have some, we have 26 prototypes. Okay. And a few things that are ready for a prime time in terms of commercial viability, like taking that to the productization level. Uh, yep. Um, are we going to get to uh, the design guide number 18? Uh, yeah, we should. Structural calculations. Yeah. Okay. I think I'll let you run that. <laughs> um, do we have time to talk about ethics right now? Uh, so it's 11.14, and we need to build ourselves a printer. What do we want to do? I would suggest we go back into the shop. Can we make our own valves is another question. Yeah, absolutely. You can do 3D printed valves. You can drill them out for precision. Uh, so low pressure valves you can do for 50 or 100 psi right now, maybe up to 500 psi out of plastic that you 3D print and then drill or machine. For heavier duty stuff, yes, but you need the heavy duty milling, which we don't have yet. But yes, valves are a part of that, including hydraulic valves for high pressure. But we're going to have to get going. Uh, thank you very much for the remote team, and we will continue again at 2 p.m. Thanks a lot. I have a suggestion.